We ended the last lecture module by reaching a sort of conclusion or an observation. And that observation is one that we see echoed in that long quote from Stanovich at the end in the summary section for chapter five. So Stanovich says, because this tendency toward the contextualization of information processing by system one is so pervasive, it is termed here the fundamental computational bias in human cognition. All of these properties conjoined together represent a cognitive tendency towards radical contextualization. The bias system fundamental because it is thought to stem largely from system one, and that system is assumed to be primary in that it permeates virtually all of our thinking. If the properties of this system are not to be the dominant factors in our thinking, they must then be overridden by system two processes. So this differential relationship, this natural inclination of our brain to advantage the system one inference and decision-making processes over system two processes is an important feature of our native inference and decision-making capacities. To illustrate this point a little bit more, what we wanna do now is go and look at a system one and a system two process that make inferences about the same sorts of things. And so we're gonna turn our attention now to inductive inferences, and we'll focus in on the representativeness heuristic as an instance of a general heuristic from system one, and we'll contrast that with a discussion of statistical inference, which is a mechanism or an inference process that can be employed using system two. So recall when we think about inductive inferences, inductive inferences are amplitude inferences. They go beyond what's guaranteed to be true given the initial information, given what a reasoner knows. And so we said we can think about this class of all the statements that are likely to be true, highly probable statements, given what a reasoner knows. Now a subset of those will be those statements that have to be true, given what a reasoner knows. But there's this whole area out here that are likely to be true. Some of these will turn out to be false, but many of them will turn out to be true, just not guaranteed to be true. When we look inside that circle of total truths, we see the reasoner's explicit and available information that they can use in their inductive and deductive inferential transformations. And we said that deduction operates by transforming some of that explicit and available information to generate explicit and available representations of information that isn't explicit and available before that inference, but that is guaranteed to be true given the explicit and available information the reasoner does already have. And so they render some of this implicit and unavailable information explicit and available for use in psychological processes and adaptive responses. When we look at inductive inference, inductive inference is amplitude in that it goes beyond that class of things that have to be true given the reasoner's initial information. And it does this by leveraging some feature of the world and introducing a certain degree of epistemic risk so that it's trying to generate information that isn't guaranteed to be true given the initial information, but is nevertheless likely to be true given that initial information. And so an inductive inferential transformation will go from that explicit and available information already possessed by the reasoner, part of that set of things that have to be true given what they know, and it will try and generate and render explicit and available statements or information that is highly likely to be true, but not guaranteed to be true. So when we think about general heuristics and we think about how they operate in system one, we can look at the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. When we think about a judgment heuristic, the way that Kahneman and Tversky thought about judgment heuristics, where that they were principles or methods 
There were ways in which our brain operates on information. And the goal of these judgment heuristics were to make assessments or judgments about the world or how to act therein. And so Kahneman and Tversky are sort of famous for formulating some heuristics that describe system one inference patterns for estimating the likelihood of events and relationships. Because these judgment heuristics are part of system, system one, they're not consciously used, they're not consciously monitored. And because they're heuristics, they're often useful, but they sometimes lead to systematic errors. And what we'll see is that these system one judgment heuristics are going to lead to systematic and often undetected errors, particularly when the conditions in which they are employed vary dramatically from the conditions under which they evolved. So we'll recall from our discussion of the evolution of humans and proto-humans over that time period, ranging roughly from seven to 4.4 million years, of which only the smallest sliver, say the last 10 or 12,000 years, represents anatomically modern humans living in agrarian and herding societies. That is, anatomically modern humans that weren't living a hunter-gatherer existence. And so we said that the basic capacities and innate dispositions that drive human inference probably evolved during this period. And that humans are making inferences in a particular sort of environment. Their inferences are being made in a relatively small environment that ranges roughly about 30 miles from where they're born and doesn't extend too much farther, in part the, because the only way they have of getting around is by walking. This environment is also relatively stable when we think of it in the context of their lifetime. So massive changes are occurring at an environmental and geological level during these multiple million years. But because your average hunter-gatherer during this period lives maybe 40 years, their lifetime just isn't long enough for things to change significantly during the course of their lifetime. And because their environment is small, because it's relatively stable, if we just look around at the world, we realize that most of those environments are gonna be relatively homogenous. There's not a lot of dramatic variation in the environment that this average human or proto-human was going to be solving problems in during this very long period of human and proto-human evolution. Now, in such an environment, the good news is that an individual's experiences are gonna likely mirror their environment fairly well. And this will turn out to be really good from the perspective of inductive inferences. And the reason why this turns out to be so good from the perspective of inductive inferences is that inductive inferences rely upon a relationship between a sample and the population from which that sample was drawn. And so Kahneman and Tversky described that relationship by calling it the representativeness relationship. And that's how the representativeness heuristic gets its name. And they say that representativeness is an assessment of the degree of correspondence between a sample and a population, an instance in a category, an act and an actor, or generally between an outcome and a model. Thus, for Kahneman and Tversky, representativeness provides the basis for statistical inference in that it uses the presence of properties and relations within a sample to infer those properties or relations within the population. And we'll now look in the next module at how representativeness between samples and populations gets exploited in the representativeness heuristic and in statistical reasoning in system one and in system two.